Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, and your Golden State Warriors are back on top of the Western Conference and the NBA standings at 19-3 after ending the Phoenix Suns' 18-game winning streak by beating them 118-96 to at Chase Center. It was an entertaining game. I gotta say that for a while... It never felt fully comfortable until I blinked and I realized the lead was up to 20. I say that because I think Phoenix is that good. Seeing them again this week, those guys just know their roles. They're young, they're confident, they have good leaders. Monty Williams, Chris Paul, Devin Booker on the bench in this one. I mean, they're just really well coached and everyone executes really, really well. I just wanted to go through the four things that I talked about in the last episode, talking about what to look for in this game. The first thing was if the Warriors could free up Steph to get cleaner, more open shots to get more comfortable. And Steph was more comfortable. He shot eight for 20, not that great, but six for 11 from three. He had 23 points. He was plus 10, played 33 minutes. He had five assists and five boards. Basically, His poor performance in Phoenix was obviously partly him. He was just off. And playing against the Suns again, they tried to switch bridges off of him a little bit more, it felt like. And I just think that the Phoenix Suns were not as sharp as they were on Tuesday. They just played in a back-to-back at home in Phoenix against the Pistons. And all their main guys played at least 30 minutes each. So they weren't super fresh, but... I feel like the Warriors were making a better effort to get Steph open, and he was just playing a little bit better in front of the home crowd as well. I thought he would have a bigger game, but you know he got picked up by the other dudes on his team. On that note, I had mentioned Andrew Wiggins and Damian Lee more specifically. Andrew Wiggins had a good game. He was 8 for 16, 19 points, plus 24, and he was aggressive. Those back spasms must have gone away because... He looked like he was moving a little bit better. He went up for what would have been an amazing lob. I think it was Draymond who threw it. And Wiggins jumped up and it looked like he clutched it and even actually brought it down a little bit. Or I don't know if maybe the pass was a little bit low. So he had to catch it lower and then like bring it up. It was going to be pretty impressive, but he he missed it. But yeah, that's definitely a positive. He did a good job. You know, at least trying to slow Chris Paul down on the defensive end. I like Wiggins on this team, man. I really do. Because he's just, as an athlete, is super necessary. And for him, he gets such easy baskets. He's wide open on his threes most of the time. And he's getting a bunch of alley-oops and back doors. So that when he goes out and tries his mid-range or his you know off the dribble moves it's like he doesn't have to rely on just those things there's a variety to his game so he's perfect for this you know a guy who can hit some threes and a guy who can catch the ball and throw it down and he's getting better around the rim Damian Lee he played finally after missing a few games after the birth of his child and he was rusty he didn't play that many meaningful minutes he was only one for four when he came in, he played like a four-minute stint and was hit his first shot. I think his other three shots came in garbage time. So Jordan Poole didn't have a good game, whereas on Tuesday night, he played well and kept the team afloat. This game, he was 5 for 12. He's plus 24, only 14 points, though. And also, Otto Porter Jr. didn't have a good game. We've come to depend on him a little bit, and he was only 1 for 4 from 3, 1 for 5 overall, 3 points. But... Gary Payton II, Juan Toscano Anderson, and Nemanja Bielitsa all showed up. Bielitsa hit two threes, had eight points overall, six boards, two blocks, and he was he was active. He brought a lot of energy, you know, playing eight and playing against guys on the Suns who were quicker than him because he kind of had faded into the background a little bit. Gary Payton the second, that guy plays really well at Chase Center. Uh, he was seven for nine, three for five from three, plus seven, 19 points, five boards. He had one massive dunk. And then obviously he also gave a great effort on the defensive end. That's an awesome game for him, right? Because 
the book on him is that he's not a great shooter. Early in the season, he was hitting his shots every now and then. And then Phoenix in the previous game had left him open, I think wide open twice, and he clanked two threes, but he hit them tonight. And I think that's a big deal. I think that's important for him to stay confident, produce, take those shots, know that he can make those. Because if he can hit those, he's no longer a liability on offense. Like we know that he can play the dunker spot, that he's great in transition. But if he can at least hit some of these shots and keep defenses honest, then it's not just like a big zero out there. You know what I mean? He has a good free throw stroke. So that always, of course, bodes well for the rest of his shooting. JTA, he had that ginormous dunk on JaVale McGee. Uh, I think he said it was like his greatest in-game dunk ever. And yeah, I can see that. It was huge. And yeah, he played He played well. In Phoenix, he kind of got sped up a little bit, made some bad passes, made some bad decisions. But in this game, he was seven for eight, one for two from three, plus 16. Five assists, five boards, 17 points. That's very, very kind of Draymond-esque, you know? So it's good to see that this team, in terms of quote-unquote depth, when some guys just aren't doing it, other guys stepped up. Yeah, I was impressed by the bench effort. When Curry sat with eight minutes left in the fourth quarter, the Warriors had a 12-point lead. I was like, okay, this is where the Suns are going to make their move. And this is where Kerr is going to catch some flack if this doesn't go well. He's going to catch some flack on this rotation. But just a few minutes later, the Warriors were up by 20. And I was like, okay, not bad. Not bad at all. Credit to them because they just kept coming and coming at the Suns. The Suns, again, were coming off of a back-to-back, so... I mean, it's a built-in excuse, but also it is a real thing, right? Sometimes you're tired. The Warriors hadn't played since Tuesday, and they were hungry, they were mad, and they were at home. In terms of DeAndre Ayton and what the Warriors could do against him to kind of mitigate his size and his physicality, Ayton was 7 for 16. (laughs) He was 9 for 11 from the line. He was minus 16 on the night, but 23 points. Only six boards. So, you know, he made some shots, but it felt like when he was missing, the Warriors were doing a better job kind of meeting him a little bit further from the basket because on Tuesday night, he was getting looks point blank and he got a couple of those, but it felt like they were trying to meet him sooner and push him out a little bit more. And in some cases that worked. You're not going to completely shut him down. And then the Chase Center crowd, I mean, I wasn't at the game. The ESPN announcers kept talking about how great the crowd was. Yeah, and they seemed loud. They seemed loud when things were going good. But there was that point towards the end of the game, sometime I believe in the fourth quarter, about six minutes left in the game. uh, Draymond Green, there was a stoppage in play, and Draymond Green put his arms up and started calling for the fans to make some noise, and they did. You know, they were kind of quiet and then they started getting louder and then they were on their feet and the announcers mentioned how the fans are still on their feet. And I was like, well, that's because Draymond kind of was like, hey, get up and, you know, make some noise. So they're getting there. They're getting there. I mean, overall, when the Warriors were playing well, the crowd definitely did seem to help, you know, work in progress, right? Work in progress. Football fans, I'm sure we all love an action-packed, high-scoring NFL game, but with the latest no-brainer from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, you'll be a winner once a single point scored. New customers who bet just $1 on any team to score can win $100 in free bets. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still get in on the NFL action. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contests. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first 
deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TBPN. Bet $1 on any team to score and win $100 in free bets. If they score, you score with promo code TBPN this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required. One per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. I said last time, it's just one game, just one win, just one loss. And that's it, right? So... The Warriors are 19 and 3. The Suns are 19 and 4. And these two teams are going to be butting heads for a while. I don't see these Suns going anywhere, not this season. And the Warriors are just going to get better and deeper and stronger. The Suns, they definitely missed Devin Booker. Mikhail Bridges, he wasn't 100% because he dislocated his pinky. And props to him for coming back into the game. And him being out for a few minutes helped Steph's cause. But the Warriors, I like our chances moving forward. We get Clay back. We get Andre Iguodala back. We get James Wiseman back. And while the Warriors were playing, Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody were playing in Santa Cruz. And Kaminga went off for, what, 27 points and 11 rebounds? Yes. It's been pointed out to me that he was minus 22 on the night. But... I will just chalk that up to the fact that when you send lottery picks to Santa Cruz, it's so that they can do and try everything without worrying about making mistakes. Sure, you want to win at all levels, but the key is for him to get comfortable, work on what he's been working on in practice, in workouts, in actual games. One thing about this game too is like the free throw discrepancy was nuts. The Warriors shot 9 for 12, and the Suns shot 26 for 35. At halftime, the Warriors had shot two free throws. They were 1 for 2, and the Suns had shot 20. They were 15 of 20. I just hate seeing games like that because, sure, one team might be a little bit more handsy than the other, and one team might be a little bit more aggressive going to the basket than the other, but that's not what we saw tonight. It wasn't that different. It wasn't like that. But whatever, they got the win, and it's just one of those games from the refs, whatever. Somebody on Twitter who actually is on the same podcast network as this show (laughs) tweeted something about how the Warriors like to showboat a lot, and (laughs) they do. They do. He got got a lot of replies from Warriors fans, and I didn't really read too many of them. But I thought it was funny because I was like, oh— I know that show (laughs) and it's a fair statement to be honest because the Warriors do showboat, but that's because it's been several years as the the greatest show on earth. So they've been the center of a three ring circus for so long, except for the last two years, that this is how they do it. This is what makes the Warriors the Warriors. Steph and his shimmies and his goofy celebrations and Draymond and his chirping and his arguing with officials. That's just how it is. Obviously, the Suns are different. And if they win a few titles, maybe they'll change. I think maybe it was an honest observation. But on Twitter, everything is out of context. But yeah, I like this Suns team a lot. Rotation is nice. Everyone knows their role. And... It's still crazy to me that they could have and they should have drafted Tyrese Halliburton in the 2020 draft. Imagine this team with him in the lineup as well, him coming off the bench. That'd be nuts. That dude is the high IQ, do everything team player that would fit in perfectly with Monty Williams' team. I kind of want to see what it would be like, but I'm also really, really glad (laughs) that he's not on that team because he would make them even deeper and younger. Dang. If I was a Suns fan, I'd be like, ah, man, could have had Halliburton. The Warriors themselves are now on a back-to-back. They play the Spurs on Saturday, and then they get the Orlando Magic. So honestly, those should be be two wins against two of the lesser teams in the league. But, uh, you know, always got to guard against letdowns 
hopefully they can close those games out early and rest guys a little bit, you know? Anyway, it's good to uh, end the night back on top of the standings. I'll take that. I'll take that any way we get it. That is another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter at Patrick Epino, E-P-I-N-O, or at Oakland Warriors. Check us out at OaklandWarriors.com, and be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen. The Oakland Warriors podcast is produced by National Film Society and is a part of the Basketball Podcast Network. And if you're so inclined, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star rating and say nice stuff about us in a review on Apple Podcasts. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time, and go Dubs.